Yes. I mean, I'm serious. You know, they're, they're, they're young and they're little and everything else, but how many of y'all would appreciate a land of snacking games like somewhere during your day? I, I think that that's something that we need to reinstitute. Nap time, nap time. I'm not, I'm not above a bringing a blue and a red mat to, to work and saying, you know, all right, y'all just finish lunch, lay down for 30 minutes. I, I think it'd be good for this nation. I think it'd be good for the world. I mean, I mean Google has proven that it is good because they have nap pods. Google has nap pods. Yeah, and really? Yeah. Are you are you serious? It's proven fact. Take 15 to 20 minute nap is good for Oh, I'm sorry. Pastor falls asleep. It's not a 15 to 20 minute nap. Well, then it's not good. It's a slumber. It's a slumber. I think I think the naps by Google, or is it Google? Mm -hmm. I think they should be, um, the times should be according to weight. <laughs> I think that for every 15 pounds, you should get 15 minutes. <laughs> so, so I, I get about 320 minutes of nap a day. That'd be, that'd be incredibly awesome. But, uh, no, <laughs> well, actually, I mean, that would be awesome, but that's not what we're here to talk about. Um, first things first, you know, as we discuss uh, each and every week, it is so important that we, we understand what, all right, I'm doing great, I'm doing, okay, uh, context, the context of every single thing that we read, because the context of scripture is what defines scripture. If we can't point out the context, we can't point out what it truly means. And what happens if we don't truly know what Scripture means? If we don't understand and recognize the author's original intent? What happens is we distort Scripture with our intent. One of the hardest things that, that, that I've seen as a pastor, as I've grown and as I've, I've, I've counseled and as I've, I've learned and I've dealt with people is... The context of scripture. Because when someone is going through a hard time, I don't know how many times I've heard exactly what I needed to hear today. Yes, you're right. That is exactly what you need to hear. But it doesn't mean what you think it means. Because what you're doing is you're taking your life and you're bending scripture around it. As opposed to taking your life and bending it around scripture. So, today, we're going to be in Revelation. <gasps> Revelation? The preacher the preacher going to teach on Revelation. Most people won't teach on Revelation. Why? Because it's intimidating. And it is a little intimidating because it's prophecy. That's the first thing we need to understand about the context of the Scripture in Revelation. Revelation is different than any other book in the New Testament. If you were to say that it was similar to a book, or where would it be placed in the canon of Scripture... As far as genre, it would be more similar to the Jewish prophecies of the Old Testament. As a matter of fact, it's written in the same manner. And many of the techniques, the, the literary techniques that are in this piece of scripture, mirror the writings in Isaiah. It does not mean that Isaiah wrote it because we know who wrote this. We know that John wrote it. We know that it was a revelation of Jesus Christ with singular, not revelations, there's one revelation of Jesus Christ as written by John. The other thing that we need to understand, there's a lot of descriptive language in here. Descriptive language is wonderful because it paints a picture in our mind. Now, you know, the, the, the prophecy that is being described is future events. How much in the future? I don't know. Because I don't know exactly when these things are going to happen. And if you do know exactly when these things are going to happen, I will drop to my knees because you are God. Because he's the only one that knows when these things are going to happen. The scripture tells us that as well. So, the descriptive language, we have to... We have to understand that, that, that John is seeing these things that are being revealed to him by Jesus Christ. And what he calls a locust may not be a locust. It may be similar to a locust as far as the way that he views it. It may be a helicopter. But 
Revelation describes literal events. Literal events that will occur in the days to come. Now, you know, there are skeptics. There's three different views on Revelation. Three different views as to where we are right now. The first one is it's called amillennialism or amillennialism. And what that means is that means that they believe that there will be no thousand year reign of Christ. Well, the problem with that whole view is that would be us denying scripture. The other problem with that view is we've got the Super Bowl coming up today. And that's not the problem with the view because the Super Bowl has nothing to do with the scripture. But it does have to do with the, the, the example that I'm going to give. There's a bunch of people that are going to bet on the Super Bowl today. And they're betting odds. They're betting odds. Now, if I were to take the odds of Scripture being wrong and describing the Millennial Kingdom, it'd be a bad bet. Because so far, prophecy is 100%. So if God says it, if God has put it in His holy, inerrant, infallible, and inspired writing called the Bible, I'm going to believe it. Therefore, I cannot believe that view on where we are at this very moment. Now, the second view that, that, uh, that some people hold, and this is a view that's, that's also been kind of taken away and kind of, you know, drifted off, it, it, it's called post-millennialism. And this is the belief that we are in the thousand-year reign of Christ because of the church. The church is Christ. And the, the, but hold on a second. It says that that would be a time of peace. It says that that would be a time of understanding. It says that the lion will lay with the lamb. It says all these things. So this was kind of shot out of the water by a couple of small events like World War I, World War II, uh, you know, ethnic cleansing, genocide, little things that just prove that it's not true. So probably, scripturally, the best view would be pre-millennialism, which means that we are living in the church age, which is the age that precedes the second coming of Christ and the millennial kingdom. So we are living in the times before Jesus Christ comes back, which now it sets, it actually sets the events of, of revelation into the proper order. Now, the piece of scripture that we are going to look at is on the second half of what's called the tribulation. Seven-year tribulation, horrible time, awful, disease, famine, natural disasters. It is not a good time to be in the world. Definitely not. Now, what are we, are we, we, we trying to share with this piece of scripture. Well, you know, the, the author's original intent and the intent that I, I'm wanting to teach on are very similar. So as we go through this piece of scripture, we're going to break it down like we usually do, but we have to understand, you know, the, 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 the genre. We have to understand the purpose. The purpose is to tell God's people, and actually not just tell God's people, but to tell the world about the salvation that can be found in Jesus Christ. I'm not going to get into the rapture today. I'm not going to talk about it. Don't feel like having an argument today. We're going to talk about we're going to talk about the the second part of the tribulation. Now, what I want you to look for as we describe this and as as we as we talk about this and as we read this piece of scripture, what do I want you to look for? I want you to look for God's grace. God's grace. Where would you be right now without God's grace? God's grace is abounding. God's grace is astounding. God's grace is amazing. God's grace is just unbelievable. For God to be able to accept someone like me is amazing in and of itself. For God to love me the way that he loves me is amazing in and of itself. For God to, to bless me with the things that he's blessed me with is amazing in and of itself. And it's not because I'm a hard worker. 
It's not because I've, I've, I've worked my way up the ranks. It's not because of anything that I've ever done. It's because he loves me. It's because he is a good father. And he loves his people. We are his people. And as we've discussed, as we, as we mentioned, Scripture tells us that once we become disciples, once we've accepted Jesus Christ, that we become sons and daughters of the Lord. So I can truly call him Father. And I can do it and understand that, that the love of that Father transcends any type of love that I've ever had in my life. Now where I am, where we are in, in Revelation chapter 14, starting with verse 6, John is, is writing and, and he says, Then I saw another angel flying directly overhead with an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on earth, to every nation and tribe and language and people. And he said with a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, for the hour of judgment has come. And worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea, and the springs of water. Another angel, a second, followed, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She who made all nations drink the wine of passion of her sexual immorality. And the other angel, a third, followed, saying, with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast in its image, receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, he also will drink the wine of of God's wrath, pour full strength into the cup of his anger, and he will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of, of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night. These worshipers of the beast and its image, and whoever receives the mark of its name, here is a call for the endurance of the saints. Those who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, write this. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Blessed indeed, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, for their deeds follow them. Again, there is a lot of meat there, But the first thing that I want to show you, the first thing that I want you to notice as we read this piece of scripture is two words. Eternal gospel. Now we have to understand that during this tribulation period, the world is just boom, going crazy. And it is full of non-believers. And the people that they are trying to reach are people that they are trying to convert to come to Jesus Christ. Even during this time in which God's wrath is being poured out upon the world, He still wants you to know Jesus Christ. Even while the world is being punished for disobedience, for the following of the Antichrist, for, for, for all the things that we've been instructed not to do throughout time, the angels and the people that remain on earth that are faithful to Jesus Christ are to proclaim the eternal gospel. See, that shows us something else. See, a lot of times we look at salvation, we look at the life, death, and resurrection as a means to an end. We say, okay, I'm faithful, I know Jesus Christ, I'm going to follow the best I can, I'm going to stay in prayer, I'm going to stay in scripture, and when I die, boom, destination heaven. Heaven is not just a destination. Heaven is a culmination of your life. Heaven is that point where you have left this earth and you are going to be with the Lord. And it's a culmination of your life and how you have grown in Christ. So it's not a destination because a destination is an ending point. It's a culmination because as you culminate, you continue to grow. So it's not, a, it's not an ending destination. It's a place where you will continue to grow and you will continue to prosper. You will continue to work in the Lord. 
So the, the salvation that God has given us, the salvation that we've received through the atoning blood of Jesus Christ, does not stop on the day of your physical death. It continues throughout eternity because God is eternal. So just, you know, it gives you a whole new spin, a whole new perspective as to what you have received from Jesus Christ. You haven't just received a ticket to go somewhere. You received an eternity in which to live and to praise and, and, and to the, 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 the description of heaven. It's beautiful. But then scripture also tells us that it's beyond anything that we could ever imagine. I've got a vivid imagination, folks. Beyond anything that I can imagine? Wow. So the gift that you have been given from God is eternal. Now the other thing that's important to know is just because we see that the angels will be proclaiming this gospel, it does not remove the responsibility that we have. We still are called to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are still called to be examples of the one true God. We are called to serve on the daily basis. This is not an out. This is not something that says you've received salvation. You can sit down until you leave this earth. More than anything else, it's a call to action. Why would it be a call to action? Because these people that are having to receive the gospel from the angels have obviously not been touched by the humans that they were living with prior to the tribulation. Prior to the first three and a half years of, uh, of the tribulation, they had not given themselves to Jesus Christ. Prior to the three and a half years, they had not had been touched by the Holy Spirit. It doesn't mean that they hadn't been shown the Holy Spirit. Don't get me wrong. And I'm not saying that they had the excuse of saying I never knew. But what I'm saying is, I'm saying is that we still have that responsibility. Do you think about it? Think about it. And I want you to read about the tribulation. I want you to read about the things that happen. I want you to read about the pain and the suffering that, that's going on during this time period. Is there anyone that you love or anyone that you know that you want to suffer through that? Because guess what? Just like I said at the beginning of this sermon, I don't know when this is going to happen and neither do you. For all we know, it could be tomorrow. Whatever you're holding back, whatever you're afraid of, whatever you don't think that you can say to your friend, your family, your loved one, you better open your mouth now. Because there is true pain and true suffering ahead for those that don't know Jesus Christ. But you see, that's the thing about Jesus Christ, is even though those people don't know him, and even though those people have denied him up to this point, even those people who close their hearts off, Jesus Christ is still willing to accept them and still willing to take them. His love for his creation goes beyond anything that we can ever comprehend. Even though he's in the time of pouring out of wrath, he's like, I'll take you out of my wrath right now. Come to me. Let me love you. Let me bring you in. I mean, how awesome is that? How, how many times do you do that in your life? You're going off on a person. You're calling them out for everything they do. You this, that, and the other. But hold on. Just say you're sorry and I love you. We don't do that as people. You know why? Because we're not God. We don't have that mechanism. So the, it's eternal. And it's always, always, always worth being shared. Now, as we, we, we get into it a little bit more, we see that the second angel comes and he starts to talk about the falling of Babylon. Now, we're going to read in chapter 16 about the actual falling of Babylon. This is where Scripture mirrors Isaiah. Because in Isaiah, Isaiah speaks as if the Christ has already died and risen, and, and, and he speaks these things. This is an example of, it's very, very common in the, in the writing styles of, 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 uh, of the time as far as prophecy goes. 
it speaks of an event as if it has already happened because they know for sure that it is going to happen because it's been revealed to them in the Lord. So what they're saying is Babylon, the Antichrist stronghold, that's the center, that's the mercantile of the Antichrist is Babylon. That's the center of, of all things during this time. That is where the, the financials, that's where, that's where it all occurs. It is fallen. So it's foreshadowing what's going to happen in chapter 16. Spoiler alert. Uh, so in chapter 16, we will see Babylon fall. But as he says, he says, the great Babylon has fallen. And he gives this, 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 this warning. Speaking of, if, if anyone, anyone receives, if anyone has, has received the, the, the mark of the beast or has received or worshipped the beast, that they are condemned. It says, a third angel Follow them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast in its image and receives the mark on his forehead and hand, he will also drink the wine of God's wrath, poured out on full strength to the cup of his anger. He will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of torment goes up forever and ever. And they have no rest, day or night. These worshipers of the beast in its image and whoever receives the mark in its name. Now we see that, that he's, he's talking about the receiving of, of a false god, a receiving of, of he, it actually beckons back to the time in the Old Testament where, where God would reach out to his people over and over and over again and then they would worship all the false gods. And it, and it, and it leads into the actual only unpardonable sin, which is the ultimate denial of the Holy Spirit by calling it evil. By hardening your heart where the Holy Spirit cannot do its work. The unpardonable sin is the inability to accept Jesus Christ and accepting the things of the world and accepting the things uh, around you as opposed to Christ. What can fall into that category? Well, we can see, obviously, that the Antichrist and the beast fall into that category, but we can also see that the worldly logic can fall into that. You know, I don't believe in the supernatural of the Bible because it doesn't match up with such and such and such and such in a worldly sense. Well, I can argue the same about your worldly sense because it doesn't match up with history and fact. We can be blinded and we can, we, can, we can block out the Holy Spirit by a number of things. So we have to understand and we have to see the lives that we are truly living. And we have to see what our actions are actually portraying. You know, if there is a Christian out there who says, yes, I am a believer in Jesus Christ, but I don't believe in creation. Well, you're not a believer in Jesus Christ. I believe in Jesus Christ, but I don't believe that his grace is enough. I believe that I have to be saved by deeds and secondary acts of faith. Well, then you're not a believer in Jesus Christ. If you believe that you need more than Jesus Christ in order to get into heaven, then you're not a believer. What you've done is you said, you know what? Your death and your resurrection was wonderful and I appreciate it. And it's a good starting point. However, I need to build on that to truly get to heaven because, you know, God incarnate, you missed it by this much. Be mindful of what you do. Be mindful of what you speak. Be mindful and make sure that your mouth and your deeds line up with what you say is your belief. And as we, we, we get down, we see that, you know, not all will be saved. We see that, you know, not everyone's going to be saved. There is a real hell. I've said that so many times. I want people to realize that. Hell is real. Just like heaven is real. He gets into it. They have no rest. The smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. That's eternity as well, folks. Just like 
those who believe in Jesus Christ have eternity in paradise, eternity in peace, eternity in, in rest, eternity in, in worship, eternity in beauty, eternity in all the wonderful things that we receive from Scripture. The non-believer, the one that has turned their back on the Lord, also has an eternity of torment, also has an eternity of no rest, also has an eternity of, 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 of just eternal torment over and over and over again. It's scriptural. Read Jesus' description of Hades. He compares it to the, to the garbage dump outside of Jerusalem where they burn bodies and burn all the trash. He compares it to that, a place where you would go up and your eyes would burn and your nostrils would burn and, and the smell was, was just hideous. And I mean, he, he describes a physical hell. Guess what? I'm going to go by his description. And then when we get to verse 12, we see that, that, that he calls for the endurance of the saints, those who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus Christ. I want to spend a little bit of time on this because this is this is important. This is this is key not only to to our survival because you know we do we do receive our salvation through Jesus Christ. There's no doubt about that. But even after we receive our salvation, even after we've come to to know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, there's times in our lives where the easy route seems to be to cut him out and to go with what we know. To go with the, the earthly route. To, to ignore the gifts that we've been given. And to ignore the possible lessons that we're learning through these hardships. To completely discard patience, which is a gift. And go and move before Jesus Christ. Right here specifically, it is calling for endurance. Not only endurance of faith, because a lot of times when we step out of his will and we get in the way of that blessing, we fall back on faith. But also in keeping with his commandments. And his commandments, his commandments are, are not hard. His commandments are things that are given to us so that we don't fall into the traps that hurt us. Think about the commandments that we've been given. The commandments of faithfulness, the commandments of love, the commandments of behavior, the commandments of morality, the commandments of ethics. These commandments that have been laid out before us, they're not just laid out as suggestions. They are supposed to be guidelines for our lives. Just like any other guideline, there's going to be times that we sway outside of them, but they should be firm and affixed in our lives. And that does not go unnoticed. Again, we were talking a little bit earlier about proclamation versus false proclamation. You know, if you don't believe those things, then that's a false proclamation. Well, also, if you don't live these things, that's a false proclamation as well. It doesn't mean that it's going to be a perfect life. It doesn't mean that you're going to be able to follow them to a T every single time. Because we are human. We do give in temptation. But it does mean that that is what's in our hearts. It does mean that when we don't follow those commandments and when we don't do what God wants us to do, that we have true repentance. That we have a true turning away from the thing that we're doing that we ought not do. It lets us understand that yes, we've messed up. Yes, we've made mistakes. But my justification that I'm about to give you with my lips doesn't amount to anything. Because the only justification is the blood of Jesus Christ. And that's where it goes right here at the very end when it says, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Blessed indeed says the Spirit that they may rest from their labors for their deeds follow them. My grandmother, her grandfather passed away this week. Both of them were blessed. Both of them knew Jesus Christ and they are in a place way better than we are. 
They are with the Father. They are enjoying their time. And they don't want to be with us. And they can't see us. They're not watching my life. Because another thing is that, 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 that heaven is a place of no sorrow. Heaven is a place where the tears are wiped away. Heaven is a place without torment. And if they watch my life, there will be tears, sorrow, and torment. They don't have a television looking down and saying, look at Scott. What in the world is he thinking? No, they're too concerned with praising and worshiping God. So amen, thank you for that. I am so glad that they don't have to see me anymore. Now we will see each other again when the day is right and when the time is right and when my mission on earth is finished. However, Nanny's not looking down upon me. The Lord's looking down upon me. He's appalled too. <laughs> but I'm covered by grace. And I'm covered by love. And I'm justified by the things that Jesus Christ did here on earth. And when we get into this piece of scripture. Now, let me see another thing about context. This is the beauty of context. is because we take the line, we look at the paragraph, we look at the words, and we look at it in the scope of, of the book, then we look at it in the scope of the, the, the Testament, the New Testament or Old Testament, then we look at it in the scope of the whole thing. So when it says that they may rest from their labors, for their deeds will follow them. Absolutely. There is a day of judgment. There's actually two different types of judgment. There's a time where the believers, the, the faithful, come before the Lord. And, and, and after the, the, the resurrection, and we come before the Lord, and we still have to face judgment, even though we are faithful disciples. That judgment is real. We will have to answer for the things that we do on earth. That's not going to escape us just because we know Jesus Christ. However, believer and non-believer alike are condemned. The difference is Jesus Christ. He's our answer. He is our answer. And why do I say that? Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. If we all had to go by our own tally sheet, death is what we would receive. It'd be add, 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 subtract, add, add, subtract, add, subtract, death. Hold on, let me do that again. Death every single time. But if you add, 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 subtract, add, 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 Jesus, tally, life. The first and the last of this piece of scripture tell the tale. One, the eternal gospel of life, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. To the end of this piece of scripture, what does that give us? Eternal life. It gives us a life on earth that culminates into being prepared to enter into heaven and serve some more and worship some more, and praise some more. So what is the key to it all? The key to it all is faith. Do you have faith that the blood of Jesus Christ is truly sufficient? Do you have faith that the gift that God gave us in his son is enough? Or do you feel like you need to add to it. Because as we force the issue and we try to add and we try to do and we try to build, you know, in our way, because what he did was not sufficient, we end up doing things for the wrong reasons. We end up doing things for self. We end up doing things for, for us to receive you know, accolades. We do things so that we will receive recognition. We do things so that, that we will receive glory as opposed to God receiving the glory. Whereas if we just submit and we say, you did it. You are my reason. You are my way. You are everything that you said you were. 
Let me humble myself. Let me come before you and let me serve you. Then those things that we do are not for our accolades, are not for our glorification, but they glorify him. People know that we are servants of the Lord. People know why we do the things that we do. And we receive that reward. Eternity. Eternity with a perfect God. In a perfect place. Partaking of perfect love. I've never seen anything here on earth that's perfect. Perfection is in my future. And when we look at these things, we can celebrate. And we can understand earthly death. And we can understand the purposes of God. And we can understand why sometimes things are a little difficult. But we can also remain faithful so that we may honor him properly and leave the mark that we're supposed to leave. Not the mark of Scott, not the mark of Nikki, not the mark of anyone else, but the mark of Jesus Christ on this earth. Y'all did? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you. We thank you for this time again when we could into your Holy Scripture, Lord, where we could receive your Holy Word, Lord, where we could gather together and celebrate the grace and the mercy that you show us, Lord. Lord, we know that without you, we are helpless. We know that without you, we are without recourse. Lord, we know that without you, we are without salvation. Lord, we pray that as we, we go through our lives, that we do give ourselves in the manner in which you want us to. Lord, Lord we pray that we receive that eternal gospel. Lord, we pray, we pray that we are instruments instruments of your glorification, Lord. And Lord, we pray that as, as we go through our days and through our weeks that other people want to come to know you, Lord, that the Holy Spirit is able to do his work and the people receive you before these times of tribulation are, are, are begun. And Lord, we pray that if there's anyone here today that is desiring to know you, Lord, that is, has had the Holy Spirit working on them, Lord, that's been pulled to you, Lord, we pray that they say this prayer, Dear Heavenly Father, forgive me of my sins, Lord. Fill me with the Holy Spirit till it overflows. For I know that the Holy Spirit is a gift given to me, Lord, through you, Lord. And I know that your Son came to this earth and lived, died, and suffered for me, Lord. And his blood atoned for the sins that I could never atone for myself. And Lord, I know that after three days in that borrowed grave, he rose guaranteeing me eternal life with you, Lord. And after walking this earth for 40 days, he ascended into heaven in front of over 500 witnesses and now sits at the right-hand side of the Father, Lord, as my advocate. Lord, I give myself to you, mind, heart, body, spirit, and soul. I thank you for saving me. In Jesus' precious and holy name, amen.